ეს არის ძალიან კარგი შესაძლებლობა თქვენთვის ყველასთვის ჩვენთვის რომ მოუსმინოთ პროფესორ სალინს და ამასთანავე შესაძლებლობა არის თქვენთვის უწინარეს ყოვლის ასტუდენტებისათვის რომ დასვათ შეგიტხები ლექცია გაგრძელდება ალბათ დაახლოებით 1 საათი ხოლო შემდეგ გაიმართება დისკუსია ახლა ნება მიბოძეთ სიტყვა გადავცე ბატონ პაატაშე შეიძლეს რომელიც მოგახსენებთ პროფესორ პასკალ სალინის მოღვაწეობის და იმ კვლევის შედეგების შესახებ რასაც ათეული წლების განმავლობაში ეწეოდა და ეწევა პროფესორი სალინი ხოთ ბატონ მოგესამებით გახლავართ პაატაში შელიძე ახალი ეკონომიკური სკოლა საქართველოს პრეზიდენტი ჩვენი ორგანიზაცია აგარ უკვე 2001 წლიდან საქართველოში ცდილობს თავისუფალი ბაზრის კანონზომიერებების შესწავლას და გავრცელებას ჩვენი ერთ-ერთი ყველაზე მნიშვნელოვანი პროექტი არის სწორედ ახალგაზრდა ახალგაზრდობას სამუშაობა სხვადასხვა ფორმით ეს იქნება ლექციები სემინარები საჯერო შეხვედრები და ასე შემდეგ ამიტომ ჩვენთვის ხიონელი ფორმატი ჩვეული და ერთ-ერთი ყველაზე აპრობირებულია. ჩვენი ორგანიზაცია ხშირად მასპიძლობს გამოჩენილ ეკონომისტებს და დღეს ესეთი პატივი გვაქვს ერთად. ბადონი პასკალ სალენი არის ფრანგი, რაც უნდა გაგვიგვერდეს, ფრანგი ლიბერალი, რაც თან იშვიათია. უფრო მეტიც, ის არის ფრანგი ლიბერტარიანელი, რომელიც ასაბუთებს როგორც თეორიულად ა ეკონომიკური თავისუფლების ჩაურევლობის პოლიტიკის აუცილებლობას საზოგადოების წარმატებისა და განვითარებისთვის. ა ბატონი სალენი არის პარიზის დეფინიციის უნივერსიტეტის მიწვეული პროფესორი, ის სულ რამდენიმე წელია თუმბურსოს შარშან ეს თქვა საპენსიო პენსიაზე გავიდა მანამდე იყო სრული პროფესორი ამ უნივერსიტეტის წლების განმავლობაში 1994-96 წლებში ბატონი სალენი იყო მონპელერენის საზოგადოების პრეზიდენტი ალბათ გაგიგიათ ამ ორგანიზაციის შესახებ ეს არის ყველაზე პრესტიჟული კლუბი ეკონომისტებს შორის რომელიც დაფუძნებული 1957 წელს მილტონ ფრიდმენის ფრიდრიხ აიეკის ლუდვიგ მიზესის და ძალიან ბევრი სხვა ცნობილი ეკონომისტის მიერ მათ შორის ყველა ამ ორგანიზაციის წევრებს შორის 9 მხოლოდ ნობელის პრიზის მფლობელები არიან. ამიტომ ამ ორგანიზაციის პრეზიდენტობა უბრალოდ წევრობაც კი დიდი აღება აღიარება და არ უბრალოდ და არ მხოლოდ პრეზიდენტობა. აა ბატონი სალენი თანამშრომლობს სხვადასხვა არა სამთავრობო ორგანიზაციებთან და ინსტიტუტებთან სხვადასხვა ქვეყანაში, მაგრამ ყველაზე უფრო მჭიდრო თანამშრომლობს მიზესის სახელობის ინსტიტუტთან, რომელიც განლაგებულია ამერიკაში ქალაქ ობონში, ეს არის ალაბამას შტატი, სამხრეთი შტატია. ალბათ მიხვდებოდით რომ ეს ინსტიტუტი სწორედ ანალოგიურ რაღაცებს იკვლევს ეკონომიკის თავისუფლებას, ლიბერტარიანულ პოლიტიკას და ასე შემდეგ, ამიტომ ახლა გარკვეულწილად ძალიან დიდი თავმოყრა არის ამ ინსტიტუტში მისი და მე ვთქოდი ჩემი თანამოაზრებისაც კი იმ მეც გახდით ამ ინსტიტუტში გარკვეული ხნით სასწავლებლად. აა მან რამოდენი მე სულ რაღაც 2-3 კვირის წინ ფაქტურად გამოსცა მისი ბოლო წიგნი, რომელიც ფინანსურ კრიზისს ეხებოდა, ეხება ამ ჯერჯერობით ინგლისური ვერსია არც კი არსებობს, არც ფრანგული ვერსია. ამიტომ ჩვენ გადავწყვიტეთ რომ თხევანდელი შეხვედრის თემა ფინანსური კრიზისი ყოფილიყო. და ესე დავა სათაური ჩვენი ლექცია. ფინანსური კრიზისი ეს არის ბაზრის ჩავარდნა, ანუ ბაზრის არასრულყოფილების შედეგი, თუ ეს არის სახელმწიფო რეგულირების მავნე გამოვლინება. და სწორედ ამაზე მინდა რომ დღეს გაკეთდეს აქცენტი. მე ვფიქრობ რომ ძალიან საინტერესო თემა თემაა, ვით უმეტეს დღევანდელ 
პირობებში, როდესაც საკმაოდ ბევრი რამ გაორკვეველია, ამ საკითხთან დაკავშირებით ბევრი კითხვა ისმის, რომელზეც ზუსტი პასუხები არ არის და არც ერთი პოლიტიკური მთავრობა, არც ერთი პოლიტიკური ლიდერი სინამდვილეში არც სწორ ანალიზს აკეთებს და არც სწორ გადაწყვეტილებებს იღებს ამ პრობლემიდან გამოსავალზე. მე აღარ შეგაწუხებთ, მე მინდა გადავსემ ამ სიტყვა, ჩვენი ლექცია იქნება ინგლისურად, თარგმანის გარეშე მე მგონი არ გაგიჭირდებათ. გთავაზობთ ეგეთ ფორმატს, მივცეთ მას საშუალება თავის სათქმელი ბოლომდე თქვას და რა დასრულების შემდეგ თუ კი გეკნებათ კითხვები ან კომენტარები გთხოვთ უკვე ხელი საწევით ზით მანიშნოთ და მე მოგცემ საშუალებას რომ თქვენი კითხვა დასვათ ან კომენტარი გააკეთოთ. უგოლო ბარაკეთ. მალოთ. და ერთი რამ რაღაცა აუცილებლად მინდა რომ თქვა ბატონი პასკალ სალენის საქართველოში ჩამოსვლა შესაძლებელი გახდა ფრიდრიხ ნაომანის ფორდის მხარდაჭერით სამცხოვრებ ამ წუთში მის წარმოდგენილი არა მაგრამ ალბათ შემოგვერტება ასე რომ მე დიდი მალობელი ვარ ამ ორგანიზაციის რომ ჩვენ ხშირად გვაძლევს ესეთი პიროვნებების მოწვევის საშუალებას მათ შორის თქვენთან აა კიბოტონო მაშინ თქვენ გამართებ მეგობრებო თბილისის თავისუფალი უნივერსიტეტის სახელით მე ვა მიბოძეთ მსოფლიოში აღიარებულ მეცნიერს პროფესორ პასკალ სალინს მივანიჭო ეკონომიკის საპატიო დოქტორის წოდება It's great honor for me to award you as honoris causa of the Queen University of So I could say that uh, this honor let me without voice but I I <laughs> try to anyhow <laughs> to shift to another part of our ceremony the most important for me was the first part and uh, once more I want to say how honored and pleased I have um, uh, to to be honored by uh, your university your university and your university our uh, our, our university now so you're right i'm a member i'm a member this is honorable for previous work and <laughs> for this work you will have more <laughs> so it's great you know to me uh, university uh, counts a lot it's a great thing and great organization and uh, being honored by university is very important for me So I was asked to speak about the financial crisis um, and uh, more specifically uh, I would like to explain why uh, this financial crisis uh, is not contrary to what is said quite usually is not a market failure but a government failure um it may seem strange to many people maybe not here in this university uh, but i think it is very important to try to uh, to uh, explain why the financial crisis is not the consequence of uh, the bad working of markets but the consequence of uh, uh, ill des badly designed uh, policies uh, and maybe what i could call the fundamental instability of uh, these policies it has been said in fact that uh, this crisis uh, is mainly explained by the fact that some uh, greedy capitalists uh, uh, have taken too many risks uh, in banks in financial organizations in order to get some high returns and from these people quite often say that uh, it is a symptom of the immorality of capitalism and that's why i would like not only to show from a purely 
economic analysis why the financial crisis is not the consequence of that, but also why it is impossible to say that the crisis is a consequence of the working of an, an immoral system, quite the contrary. So to try to explain that uh, and to try uh, also maybe to uh, help uh, you to better understand what can happen in the future, I would like first to emphasize the role which has been played in this crisis by monetary policy. I think it is the most important factor of the financial crisis. Then I will uh, shift to a second part in which I will evaluate the other causes of the financial crisis. But I think it is important to see that um, there have been several factors of the financial crisis, but all of them can be understood with the same vision of things. And broadly speaking, it can be said that this crisis is a consequence, contrary to what is frequently said, of a lack of capitalism, a lack of the discipline of capitalism, which implies, in my opinion, that under such a system, people are responsible. And I must say that quite often in our time, whenever there is an economic problem, and you, if you do analyze things correctly, you find that uh, there is a problem of a lack of responsibility. Responsibility, individual responsibility, is really the key to understand a lot of economic and social problems. So uh, after having explained the causes of the crisis, I would like um, to, uh, to evaluate the, the policies which are currently uh, in use in different countries and uh, try to define uh, what would be the best ways to uh, try to go out of this crisis. And finally, um, I will say some words about this problem of uh, morality and immorality, since it has been one frequent question about the crisis, and I would like to try to assess to which extent we can say that there were some uh, immoral behaviors in uh, uh, the working of this crisis. So let me begin with the problem of uh, monetary policy. Um, I want to stress that monetary policy has been the main cause of the financial crisis, as it has been in other occasions. I'm thinking, for instance, of the big depression in the 30s in the US and in other countries in the world, but even closer to us, uh, the problem uh, uh, in the uh, 2000s, uh, the economic crisis, which has been less important than the recent one. But I think we can say that uh, all financial crises in uh, the modern world were crises caused by monetary policy. And that's the reason why it is important to better understand that in order to better uh, forecast the future and, if possible, to avoid the uh, possible future crisis in the future. And it is quite obvious, if I'm right, in explaining the crisis mainly by uh, the monetary cause, monetary policy, it is quite obvious that monetary policy is not made by the market. It is made by monetary authorities. Uh, central banks can be more or less independent from the political power, but anyhow, they belong to what could be called the state monopoly. There is a monopoly in the design of monetary policy. It is a public monopoly. And uh, uh, so if it is true, as I believe it is, that monetary policy is responsible for the crisis, I cannot understand why people say that it is a failure of markets and that markets have to be uh, better uh, regulated. I will go come back to go back to the problem of regulation uh, later on. 
In, a, in order to better understand the working of this crisis, I would like to propose two models. Uh, the first model I will call the reference model. It is more or less close to what we could know, for instance, in Europe in the 19th century. And the second model will be the model of modern times. Um, and we will see that, in fact, beyond the problem of monetary policy, which I stress, uh, there are, uh, more generally, a, a problem of the economic system of our time, and that uh, some other problems are linked to the monetary uh, policy problem. As a reference model, I would like to propose to you is the following. I will characterize it by two things. The first characteristic of this model is a situation in which there is a very great amount of savings and, a specific, and in this particular, uh, a great amount of what we can call equity capital, uh, for instance, shares uh, or uh, uh, owning of uh, uh, private uh, enterprises. Um, savings, you know, is very important for growth because it is impossible to have growth without having innovation, new techniques, and so on. And in order to introduce new innovations, we need accumulation of capital. In the reference model I'm thinking of, I make the assumption that people voluntarily want to save. It means that they accept not to consume all their resources, all their income in the present, and they accept to keep part of the resources in order to accumulate capital and to have a better life in the future. In uh, the second characteristic of this model uh, is, uh, uh, consists in the fact that there is no monetary policy. It may seem strange to you to speak about a situation without monetary policy, but we must not forget that for the longest part of history, there was no monetary policy. There was no central bank. There were no monetary authorities. In spite of that, the world developed and sparkled. Uh, uh, the thing of, of, of European economies uh, was, uh, 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 took place uh, without any monetary policy. Uh, in fact, for long, uh, people using using gold, silver, uh, and some more commodities are, mo are money, and they did not need to have a pure creation of money. I will come back to that uh, later on. But we are accustomed to the idea that it is impossible to have uh, an economic system without monetary policy, and that monetary policy has to be done by monetary authorities. And quite often in textbooks, you find the idea that one of the main uh, roles of the state is to uh, design monetary policy in order to stabilize the economy. And we will see that, in fact, it is exactly the contrary with, which is happening, and that because monetary policy exists, there is destabilization of the economy. Uh, in this reference model, the interest rate is very stable. The interest rate is a very important uh, variable because the interest rate is the price of time. When you save and you lend your resources to someone else, you ask an interest rate, and the interest rate is the price you get for uh, accepting not to consume now what you have and to consume in the future. That's why the interest rate is the price of time. And uh, in the reference model I have, the, uh, the interest rate is very stable just because there is no reason uh, for the demand and supply of savings of what is called loanable funds to change very rapidly within a few uh, years, within a couple of years. Because, for instance, people have more or less stable incomes and they share 
there in come between consumption and uh, savings in more or less constant uh, uh, fractions. And similarly, it is possible that uh, uh, those who need to borrow uh, change very rapidly uh, their needs of savings. Uh, so you have supply and demand which are rather stable and stable interest rate, which is very important. And in fact, during all history, the interest rate has been very, very stable until, let me say, the 19th century uh, and the beginning of the 20th century. Now, uh, I come to the modern model, to the model of our time, and it is character characterized by two things. First, there is a lack of savings. People are not saving sufficiently, and to me, one main reason for that is taxation, because taxation quite often uh, is punishing the fact that people are saving. I have no time to explain why. Uh, maybe I, just, I can just stress the following. Um, if ever someone gets an income and he pays the income tax, I take the example of the income tax, but I could take some other examples, then there is something which is left to him after he has paid the tax, and he can either consume or save what, he, what is remaining. If he is consuming what, he, what is remaining to him, uh, the, uh, the resources uh, he was owning are destroyed by consumption, and they can no more be taxed. But if ever this person chooses to save and to accumulate capital, the return on savings in the future will be taxed by the income tax. It means that there is a double taxation of uh, savings in comparison with consumption. So that's one reason, and I could show that for, uh, for other uh, taxes also. And there are also... Uh, and there are also taxes on capital in some countries, my country, for instance. And another reason for that is uh, in, that in the 20th century, uh, in many countries, I think it's not the case here, but in many countries there is a system of pay-as-you-go pensions, which means that people know that whenever they have to retire, uh, when they are old, uh, they will be... Uh, they will be financed by other people, by compulsory uh, policies. And so they, are not, they have no incentives to accumulate capital during their working life because they know that their uh, standard of living will depend on what uh, other people will give them through uh, the constraint of the state. And uh, in fact, they have, when they are working, they pay for others and when they retire, they are paid by others. So this uh, system of taxation, this system of pensions, are destroying the incentive to save. And it is not surprising if, for instance, in the US, it is quite often said that the rate of savings is very, very low, uh, two to three to four percent according to years, and uh, growth can be financed uh, in the US, uh, in particular, but because we have in the world some emergent economies like China, Singapore, India, and so on, where the rate of savings is high. And it is high just because people have to care themselves about their, uh, uh, their necessary um, financing in the future if there is risk, and so on. So, uh, in many uh, countries, in Europe, in uh, in the U.S. and so on, the rate of saving is, uh, is low. And more than that, there is a low amount of responsible capital, of uh, equity capital, uh, which means of real property rights. Uh, when you are the owner of a, of a share in a firm, for instance, you are an owner and you, you are responsible because you know that uh, what you get from your share is a consequence of the good uh, management of the, of the firm. And so there is responsibility because there is 
property. There is property, excuse me. There is property. Now, uh, so in the modern world, the rate of savings is low in many countries, and uh, especially uh, equity capital is low. And the second characteristic is that we have monetary policy. What does it mean, monetary policy? It means that the central bank is controlling uh, the other banks, and the system as a whole is producing money but whenever money is created, there is a counterpart which is credit. And, but this credit, this credit is purely artificial and illusory. As I just said, there is a lack of savings in the modern world. And so monetary authorities believe that they have, find, that they have found a way to substitute to this lack of savings by creating artificially money and credit. So investment is financed by, in three ways, by equity capital, which is very low, by voluntary savings and the form of loanable funds, which means funds which are lent to investors, and served by money and the corresponding creation of credit. It is an illusion. It is an illusion because people believe that there is enough savings to finance a larger amount of investment than it really exists. People don't want to save a lot. They want to consume, but monetary authorities are doing as if there was less consumption and more savings. But you can understand that it is incoherent to let people consume much, the, more, the greatest part of their income, and at the same time to let people believe that it is possible at the same time to finance more investment that it is possible from voluntary savings. That's the main problem in modern economies. The problem of our time is that you can create credits from nothing credits from nothing, in spite of the fact that there are not enough people who are uh, ready to save sufficiently to finance uh, what is uh, lent to the investors. And to, in order to, uh, to create money and to expand the amount of credits based on money creation, uh, monetary authorities are decreasing the interest rate. They are manipulating this very important price, the price of time. We do know that each time uh, a government is manipulating a, a price, there are perverse effects, there are bad effects. For instance, if it is decided by the government that uh, uh, the rent of the, uh, uh, for houses, for flats, uh, have to be low, people will no more build houses and, and apartments because it will not be profitable enough for them. So it is the same with uh, uh, savings if the authorities are imposing a, a low interest rate, there will be a very high demand by investors but a low supply of savings uh, by potential savers. So there is a gap, an increasing gap, between the demand for savings and the supply uh, of savings. That's exactly what is created by monetary policy. And we see that exactly uh, in the recent past. Uh, let us take the example of monetary policy in the US. There was a, a crisis in the, in the year 2000, and uh, after that, uh, monetary authorities expanded the quantity of money, the quantity of credit, and decreased the rate of interest. The rate of interest of the main rate of interest imposed by the Federal Reserve System to banks, what it is called the Federal Funds Rate, decreased from 6.5 in 2000 to 1% one only in 2003. It is really incredible. In the reference model I described before, you could not imagine such a big change uh, in uh, interest rates. I know that the fluctuations 
of interest rates on the markets was not that big, but anyhow it existed. And so you can see that uh, there was a fundamental instability introduced by monetary policy uh, in that way in very few years. And it is really ironical because it is always said, and it is said in textbooks, that monetary policy is necessary because uh, through monetary policy, uh, the public sector is able to stabilize the economy, and we see that it is exactly the reverse. It is exactly the reverse. Uh, there is uh, an instability in the uh, rate of interest, in the quantity of money, and in uh, the quantity of uh, credits. And what has been done by the, the U.S. monetary authorities has more or less been done also, for instance, by the European Central Bank, by the Japanese Central Bank, the British one, and so on. It, there has been a sort of imitation effect, but a perverse imitation effect. I don't know why quite often public authorities are imitating bad ideas and not good ideas. And so in the world as a whole, there was this instability um, in, uh, uh, in the rate of interest uh, and in, the, in credits. So there was a lot of liquidity, a lot of money available all over the world. And as we are in a globalized world, money which is created in the US can uh, spread all over the world and the same for money created in Europe and so on. And I remember that uh, some years ago, uh, financial people said uh, it is incredible the liquidities which are available, we can finance a lot of things. But when you have so, so many monetary resources, so, much so many credits, what can you do with that? You are induced to finance projects which are worse and worse. When there is a normal rate of interest, you compare the rate of interest and the rate of return you can get on your investment. And you choose the best investment with the highest return and, if possible, a degree of risk which is not too, uh, too important. But when you have a lot of credits available, and credit is not expensive, you can borrow at a very low rate of interest, maybe even a negative real rate of interest. It has been the case in the recent past. So you can finance anything and you say it is worthwhile to finance an investment with a low rate of return and a very risky investment. And that's exactly what happened in the recent past. So uh, having said that, I would like just to uh, to give some uh, uh, very rapidly some elements about uh, economic theory because uh, I was struck by the fact during the recent crisis that uh, in, at least in my country but uh, uh, I know it's the same in many countries in the US for instance maybe somewhat less anyhow in the US people were opposing two theoretical models and they said on the one hand there is the Keynesian model developed by Keynes and the Keynes and, the, uh, and other economists. And on the other hand, there are the monetarists with Milton Friedman and, and so on. And usually people said Keynes was right and Friedman was wrong. And it is because we, we listened that Friedman, we liberalized the finance and so on that we had this crisis. They were wrong to say that because in fact, uh, the crisis cannot be, be explained by uh, what is developed in the Keynesian theory. As you do know, uh, in the Keynesian theory, it is said that um, if we have uh, a low rate of activity, if we have an unemployment, it is because there is a lack of total demand, and the solution is to create a new demand, which, in my opinion, is impossible. But there was no problem no problem of total demand. There were, there were too many credits, which means that there was too much demand for uh, investment goods. Now, 
uh, monetarists are uh, right when they say that creating money has uh, as a consequence to create inflation. But the problem is that uh, both the Keynesians and the monetarists only take a global view of the economy. A global view, uh, they are interested in only in, for instance, uh, GNP, the rate of inflation, and so on and so on. And there is a third school of thought, uh, which, in my opinion, is the only one, the only one which is able to explain the financial crisis, which is called the Austrian, economy, the Austrian school of economics. And especially, there was a theory, there is a theory of the business cycle, which has been first developed by Mises and Hayek. That's why it is called the Austrian School of Economics and the, Austri and, uh, the business cycle, uh, the theory of the business, uh, the Austrian business cycle, because uh, Mises and Hayek were of Austrian origin. And this uh, theory of the business cycle explains that um, the financial crisis is the consequence, as I said, of a too expansionary monetary policy. But one important consequence of this expansion of credit and money is not only the global consequence on inflation, for instance, but what is maybe even more important is the consequence on the structure of production. Because the distribution, the large distribution of credits induces people to develop uh, sectors of investment with long duration, long processes of production. And factors of production are shifted, for instance, for the sectors of consumer goods to sectors of investment goods like uh, housing, uh, uh, car production, and so on and so on. And so there, is, there are important distortions in the structure of production and in the structure of prices, uh, of relative prices, because of these changes in the structure of production. And this new structure of production cannot last forever because they do not correspond with the structure which is desired by people. I told you we are in a situation where people don't want to save m very much. They want to consume. But factors of production are shifted to other sectors and taken away from the sectors of consumer goods. So it is incoherent. People are uh, asking for consumer goods, but there is a, an inducement to produce factors of production because the rate of interest is very low. And uh, meanwhile, there is also an inducement to take too many risks. So this is the main cause of the financial crisis. And I wanted to stress first that there is one school of thought which explains the crisis quite well, which is the Austrian theory, theory of the business cycle. And uh, I wanted to to stress that uh, uh, certainly if it is true that the main cause of the financial crisis is this monetary policy, it is completely uh, wrong to attribute the crisis to a bad working of the markets, a bad working of the financial system. Now, I shift to the other causes of the financial crisis. One is rather well known, which is the uh, the working of the housing sector in the US. As you know, the financial sector uh, accepted to finance what is called subprimes. Uh, subprimes are credits attributed to people who, in fact, uh, have, may not be very well uh, able to uh, reimburse uh, what they have borrowed. And so the degree of risk of these credits, of these assets, is uh, high. And as you know, uh, these uh, uh, subprime credits have been mixed with other assets and sold all over the world 
and it was difficult to assess the risk of this uh, new um, instrument. But there is something which maybe is not widely known, which is that there was an explicit policy of the, the US government in order to develop subprime credit. And um, uh, the banks were more or less obliged to, uh, to accept these credits uh, because uh, monetary authorities and the government uh, introduced a lot of instruments uh, to that end. For instance, some banks have been punished uh, because they had not, in the view of the government, accepted uh, to grant credits uh, sufficiently to people uh, who were uh, who had a very high degree of risk. It was said that, that and they were punished. How, for instance, because they were forbidden to develop new branches, to develop new activities, and so on. And it was said at the time that uh, bank ought not to discriminate against people uh, who were not very safe, against people uh, who had a very high degree of risk. And this is really strange because the role of a bank is to discriminate <clears throat> and to try to decide who uh, is able to reimburse and who is less able to reimburse. So you see in this example too that uh, the subprime crisis, which was one of the main uh, aspects of the financial crisis, is a consequence of the, uh, an explicit uh, policy and not of the working of the market. If led to himself, to itself, the market would not have accepted to grant so bad credit to so many people. It, it seems nice from the government to try to finance housing for people who have low incomes, for instance, and so on. But in fact, it is not because these people it has been discovered later on, these people in fact were unable to reimburse what they had borrowed and many of them had to sell their houses at a lower price than the price they had bought. And it has been very dramatic for them. So in the short run, the government gives the feeling that it is helping the poor people, but in fact it is a short run view and in the long run, uh, there is a real problem for these categories of people. This, uh, so the first cause of the crisis is the monetary policy. The second one is the housing policy. But this very expansionary housing policy would not have been possible without the expansion of monetary policy and the credits linked to monetary policy. So both of them are not a result of the bad working of the market, it is a result of the bad working of policies. It is a policy failure and not a market failure. The third, the third factor is regulations. It has been said that uh, the financial market, the financial sectors have been deregulated, especially in the US, and that it was the cause of the crisis because uh, the financial sectors were free to do anything they wanted and, for instance, to take too, too many risks. This is not true. This is not true first because the financial sectors everywhere in the world remain among the most regulated, regulated sectors. But also because it is possible to demonstrate that many regulations have been incoherent or even um, where uh, uh, a cause uh, of the crisis. I have not enough time to develop all uh, the problems of, the, of regulations and give exam uh, examples of all the regulations. I would like just to give one example. You do know that it is quite often said that it is necessary to have a central bank whenever you have a monetary system because the central bank 
plays two main roles. It plays the role of controlling the creation of money, and we, we know that this role is not very well played quite often, because there is too in in a monetary policy which is too expansionary. And the second role is, it is said, uh, to be a lender of last resort. The idea is that um, there is specifically in the financial sector what is called a systemic risk, which means that there is a risk inherent to the system whenever a bank is failing, there is a risk that other banks fail, fail also because there are links between the different banks. And so it is said it is necessary to have a lender of last resort which is able to lend money to a bank whenever there is a risk of failure in order for it to survive. But the consequence of that is quite the contrary of what is assumed because in fact the fact that there is a lender of last resort gives a bad signal to the market, to the banks. Banks know that if ever they take too many risks, uh, they will not fail, they will not go bankrupt. But there is someone, the central bank, which will help us. And I remember in the 80s there was also a debt crisis a world debt crisis, but it was mainly a debt from uh, an excessive borrowing by uh, developing countries, in particular Latin America. And I remember at that time I had met a, an American banker and he told me you cannot imagine to which extent the Federal Reserve System is telling us you have to lend to Latin America and to developing countries. That's our policy. And if ever you have a problem, you lend for anything, even for bad investment and so on. And if you take too many risks and you have problems, we will be there to save you and to avoid uh, bankruptcy. So it's exactly what happened. Uh, banks, and especially big banks, know that uh, the risk of failure is low. It's not zero, but it is low. We have seen the crisis, in the crisis that some banks uh, failed, uh, but uh, some big banks were saved by monetary authorities. And it is in fact quite characteristic that during the recent crisis, uh, some banks which were in a bad position, which had taken too many risks, were bought by other banks, which do mean that there were very different situations. Some had been uh, better managed than other ones, which means that there is no systemic risk. Uh, there are some specific situations. Some banks take too many risks. Some other banks uh, are uh, wiser. And so the banks which take too many risks are mainly banks which believe that they will be saved by the central monetary authorities. So we see, you see with this example that uh, uh, it is not a lack of regulation which explains uh, the financial crisis, quite the contrary. It is because there is a regulation uh, introducing a bad signal that uh, uh, the markets are uh, uh, induced to take too many risks. Now, I would like to go to the last cause of the financial crisis. Uh, which has not been underlined, and I think it is important. Uh, it is a problem of governance by bank. I, I reminded you that the, the usual idea is that bankers, bankers, uh, greedy bankers, uh, took too many risks in order to get high returns because there was a large amount of liquidities uh, to get bonuses, bonuses, and. Uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, of higher uh, returns, returns like stock options and so on. Now, when people speak of bankers, uh, they use a very general term, and we have to see more precise, precisely what is the reality. I reminded you that in the 19th century and before that, 
uh, there was a large amount of savings, and in particular, uh, there was a large amount of equity capital. And it is important to know that in the 19th century, equity capital of banks was about 60 to 80 percent of the balance sheet of banks, which means that banks were owned by capitalists who were lending or using their own money. And so as they were the owners of the equity capital, they did not want to take too many risks because they knew that if ever they were taking too many risks, the bank could go bankrupt and they would lose all their capital. They were responsible because they were the owner of the bank. They, were, they had property rights. We are, we are in a completely different world. And one reason for that, once more, is taxation, but also regulation and so on. Taxation for the following reasons. Uh, we are in a situation in which the state implicitly say to people, if ever you are doing good project uh, and you have a return from what you have done, from your investment, then uh, the state will take a great part of your income as taxation. And so the return is low. But the risk you must take. And if ever you have made bad investment, you go bankrupt and you have to bear the risk by yourself. So in this case, there is an asymmetry and people are less uh, uh, induced to, uh, to be uh, shareholding holders and they want to diversify their portfolios. And so uh, now, uh, we have big banks because we know that big banks have a higher probability to be saved by central banks, by the monetary authorities in case of problems. So little by little, the, the small personal banks disappear and we have very big banks. And these big banks are owned by a great number of small uh, shareholders who have no possibility to uh, modify decisions. And decisions are taken not by capitalists, but by the managers of the firms, of the banks. And the managers are not capitalists, they are wage earners. And as such, they have a short-run vision. They are choosing the short-run because whenever you are a wage earner and not a capitalist, you have an interest in trying to get the highest possible income in the present because you don't know how it will be the future. When you are a capitalist, you don't want to go bankrupt and you, you are looking at the long run. So you see, it is, it is somewhat wrong to speak of bankers without making this distinction between the owners who are responsible and the managers who are wage earners and who don't take the risk of a bankruptcy, uh, who are not responsible for uh, this risk. So you see that uh, the crisis certainly was partly due to the fact that some managers took too many risks because they wanted high bonuses, high stock options, and so on. I don't disagree with that. But it is a consequence of the working of a system which is not really a capitalist system. And if we want to avoid this, we would have to go back to the capitalist system we had in the 19th century. No more regulations, but more capitalism. We are in a system where we have a pseudo-capitalism, a capitalism without capitalists. Now, I know that I have uh, taken already too many time, but... Uh, it's always the case with me. I'm sorry for that. Um, if you allow me, I would anyhow like just to give uh, short comments about what is happening now and what could happen tomorrow. 
and especially to stress the consequences of the policies which have been adopted all over the world in order to try to go out of the crisis. We just saw that uh, the financial crisis was a consequence of a, a too expansionary monetary policy and that the consequence was uh, the introduction of distortions in the structure of production. It is not a global problem. It is a problem of structure of production. The working of mass of markets has been disturbed by policies. And now we have to adjust. And who can adjust? Markets. Because markets are the only possibilities to adjust to a new structure of price, a new structure of production, which is coherent with what people want, with a structure of demand between consumption and savings. So the solution of the problem would be just to let market work and do the adjustment. Do nothing. I know that it is difficult for a politician in our time when people believe that public authorities are responsible for economic activity, it is difficult for a politician to say the best solution for the financial crisis is to do nothing. But in fact, it would be. It would be. I know only one who did that, the president of the Czech Republic, Václav Klaus, but he's a good economist, that's the reason. And, uh, but uh, most uh, politicians said, we have to uh, to take care of the of economic activities, it was disturbed by the markets, and so the policies have to save the situation. It is, in fact, exactly the contrary. And, in fact, uh, we see that uh, the decisions which have been taken, taken all over the world are, in my opinion, wrong decisions. Let me just take a very short and rapid list. First, many or maybe all countries, all governments, have decided to introduce what they call recovery policies. And what is a recovery policy? It is some, something which is inspired by Keynesian economics. Keynesian economics say, whenever there is an economic problem, you just have to spend money. You must spend more money, and you have, for instance, to... Uh, to increase the public deficit or to create a public deficit. Public deficit in the US now is about 12% or 13%. It is really incredible. In my country, it jumped from 3% to 6%. So it is really strange that uh, at the time when uh, firms, individuals are obliged to reimburse the de their debts, and have less possibilities to get credits, to borrow money, the states do exactly the reverse. We were in a period when there was too much credit, and we have to go to a period where we find back the real amount of savings, the one which is desired by people, and in spite of that, the, government, uh, the governments are spending money, because they just have learned from Keynes that uh, whenever you have uh, a, a, an economic crisis, you, you have to spend money. But how do they spend money? Either they increase taxes, which means that public demand is increased at the, expand, at the, expand, uh, at the expense of private uh, demand. There is no increase in total demand. It's a pure illusion to believe that it is possible to increase total demand. You can shift demand, you cannot increase it. So either you finance by taxes, and it means that resources are taken from responsible people who have uh, created wealth and who want to use this wealth in some ways which is useful for them and given to not responsible people who will deep spend the resources in any way. Keynes even said that it was useful to spend money to dig holes without any 
utility, which is really crazy, you know, uh, to, to recommend to waste resources. And that's exactly what is done right now. I, I just give you an example in France. Uh, uh, the, the president of the Republic uh, decided one day to borrow a great amount of money. He said, we to solve the crisis, we will borrow money. And after that, he asked the question to the ministers, to special committees, and, and so on. How will we spend the money? How we will we spend the money? It is really crazy, you know, because just imagine a, an entrepreneur saying, I borrow a lot of money. And after that, he, he, he goes to his uh, uh, advisor, directors, and so on, and say, you know, I have borrowed a lot of money. Now what can I do with this money? How can I spend this money? It is really crazy to do that way, and no one does that. In part, uh, an individual doesn't say, oh, I borrow money from the bank, and after that I, I will decide how I, I use it. First, we decide what you want to do, and second, you decide whether you can borrow, you want to borrow the money, or to save on other spending, and so on. So, you know what, how it works. Uh, governments are used to this idea that it is good to spend whatever they do. So either they finance through taxes, and I said that uh, it decreases uh, private demand, or they borrow money, and it also means that in a, an environment where there is less savings, uh, a larger part is taken by governments, and it makes more difficult for people to finance investment. We are in a situation where there is a low rate of activity, and it would be necessary that people invest and they are prevented from, invested, from investing because a large part of savings, available savings, is taken by the government. So that's completely wrong policy. The second uh, answer which has been given by governments consists in creating money once more. And as you know, right now, the Federal Reserve System, for instance, decided that its target was to have a Federal Reserve uh, Fund rate of about zero. About zero. That's completely crazy, too. And there is right now a great amount of money which is uh, created in the U.S., but not only in the U.S., in other parts of the world, too, with the risk of a new financial crisis. The crisis came from a too expansionary monetary policy, and they are just repeating exactly the same thing, creating completely illusory um, credits by, through money. The third answer which has been given is to increase regulations. And, uh, and happily, the president of France has been particularly active for that, uh, because people say that uh, uh, the market is uh, uh, short-sighted and uh, it is uh, assumed that only the governments are able to see the long run, which is not true, and we could see that from experiment, from experience. So they are introducing all over the world, new regulations. And um, the consequence will be uh, certainly uh, more difficulties for the working of markets. Um, certainly, the working of markets um, need rules. But the problem is that it is possible for people on the market to develop the useful rules. We don't know in advance to which extent we have to apply such or such rule. We have to discover from experiment. And one of the great merit of a free economy and market and the functioning of market is certainly that you cannot avoid errors because we are not in a world of perfection. But in a market economy, people learn from their errors and try to find solutions. Whenever there is a regulation, you, are no, you have no possibility to experiment, and so no possibility 
to invent new rules, new standards, and so on. Just let me take the example of bonuses, because bonuses have been very often quoted as one cause of the financial crisis. Why do bonuses exist? Because they give uh, people uh, an incentive to take the good decisions. They know that they will get a high bonus if the bank has done good investment, good decisions, and is profitable. So there is a positive aspect. The negative aspect is that there is the risk that people uh, take too many risks in order to have high bonuses in the short run, which in, in fact more or less happened. But it is the responsibility of the owners of the bank to decide what is the good bonus policy, to which extent bonuses have to be distributed in the short run or in the long run according to such a scheme or another one or the, how, uh, what ought to be the amount of bonuses and so on. And they have to learn from experiment. The, a government doesn't know what is the optimal rate of bonuses to be distributed. It decides anything and there is no possibility to know if the decision was a good decision or a bad decision. So you see that uh, uh, the decisions which have been taken by governments quite often, or I should say always, were not good answers to the crisis. And I would like just to add one thing. It is that uh, uh, governments always said, or usually said right now, that the world is globalized, and certainly financial markets are globalized. And so they say it is necessary uh, to have harmonized policies between countries to globalize economic policy in some sense, because in a globalized world, it is necessary to have coordinated economic policies. It is necessary to, necessary to have cooperation between governments. And as you could see recently, there were meetings of heads of states and the governments, for instance, in the case of the G20, with a, uh, a meeting of the heads of state of the most important countries, and they tried to harmonize their uh, decisions, regulations, budget policies, tax policies even sometimes, and so on, uh, once more as an answer to the globalization of financial markets. And I think that it is completely wrong, uh, also for the, for the following reason. It is not because a policy is a bad policy, a stupid policy, an unfair policy, that it becomes a fair policy, an efficient policy, a, a good policy, just because it is coordinated by several governments. Bad policies remain bad policies. And they are even worse when they are adopted by many governments than when they are adopted by a limited number of governments. I believe that competition is always good because competition um, induces people to do better than other ones. And competition is good uh, if it is good for producers, it, is, it ought to be good also for governments. It is better to have competitive governments than to have cooperation between uh, governments, to have harmonized uh, economic policies. And governments make an error when they say that it is necessary to have a globalized economic policies because we have a globalized world. Because a globalized world means that there is competition between producers all over the world. And because there is competition between producers, there is a tendency to more diversification. If you, as a producer, are under competition of other producers from other countries, you try to differentiate, you try to propose, to supply something different from other people. So globalization doesn't mean unification of the world, 
It means quite the contrary, diversification of the world. So you see, if you want to answer to the globalization of the world by, uh, in the field of policies, the answer ought to be more diversification of policies, less cooperation between governments, more competition between governments. And you see how there can be a, a bad uh, interpretations of world. People speak about globalization and they don't see what it means exactly and they just uh, give image. The world is globalized, so we have to globalize economic policy. And there is a risk. We, we are in such a situation. We, there is a risk that little by little, there is the emergence of a world government which would decide exactly the same thing for all people over the world with the consequence that bad policies as the one we have seen, which have been the cause of the, finan of the financial crisis, that the same policies be decided for the whole world at the same time without possibility to choose other policies to emigrate to other places where better policies would be adopted. So uh, one bad consequence of the financial crisis uh, for the long run is this increased cooperation between governments which in some sense are just the beginning of a world governance of citizens. And in that case, it is the future of freedom which is endangered. And I think it is important uh, to react to that and to try to make people understand that we have to save something which is very precious, which is individual liberty, and that we cannot do it by the cooperation of government. And we have to make clear that economic problems do not come from uh, the fact that markets do not work well, but the, the fact, from the fact that uh, there are public decisions. As I told you when beginning, uh, it is quite often said that uh, uh, capitalism is not moral and that the crisis has been the consequence of the immorality of markets. I have not the time to discuss this problem of morality, but anyhow, from uh, uh, what I know of, the, of capitalism, I think that it is a contradiction to say that capitalism can be immoral because <coughs> capitalism is founded on uh, the fact that you have to be respectful of the rights of other people and because of that you have to be respectful of the freedom of others. And so it is impossible, it is a contradiction to say that uh, capitalism, which is founded on the, uh, on the fact that the people are free to act, that capitalism could be immoral, and that immorality is a cause of instability in the world. I thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor, for so interesting and distinguished lecture. I think that there must be the questions, please. You have the question, I see. In the situation when you have huge deficit in uh, Greece, in Sp uh, Spain, in Portugal, Britain, and Ireland, uh, I Iceland, yeah. Um, uh, uh, my name is or the other, with very different uh, budget policies, very different tax policies, very different economic situation, and so on. It is quite true that often in history, we have had the following situation, a very huge budget deficit, and the budget deficit was financed through monetary creation. And from this point of view, there is a relation between monetary creation and budget deficit. But it is not automatic, and budget deficit could be financed on the financial market you could have a very, very stable monetary policy with a very high uh, budget deficit 
it just implies that the government would have to pay a very high risk premium. And so the reason why I was against uh, the introduction of the euro was that this link between budget policy and introduction of the euro had been created with what you know as a Maastricht criteria. And so if ever you were speaking of uh, tax cuts in France, for instance, the government was saying we cannot do tax cuts because there would be too high a deficit and we could not enter into the euro. So I thought it was more important to have the tax cuts than to have the single currency. And I should say about the same right now. You just mentioned the Greek crisis. Why is there is a Greek crisis? Because the government spent too, ma too much money and tried to hide uh, the real situation. Uh, I was struck by the fact, by the way, that uh, 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 people were uh, critical about the audit firm uh, which helped the Greek government to hide the rea reality, but they, they found it was quite normal that the government tried to, 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 to lie and to hide the reality. And for instance, uh, Angela Merkel was very critical about uh, the, the, the audit firm and not against uh, the government. There is always a double standard in opinion, which is very strange in my opinion. Anyhow, if the Greek government has spent too much money, it has to, to bear the consequence. And the consequence is, is that it has to, re to reimburse and to pay risk premium, very high risk premium. And the other European countries ought not to be concerned by the Greek problem. If I was a head of state of a European government, I could not be because I'm a liberal, but if I was a head of state of a European government, uh, I would say, well, yeah, they are responsible. They have decided to spend money. They take the consequence. Why would we, would, we would have to help uh, to hold them? And here, too, we have a, a double standard. What is doing a banker? A banker is giving credit to people who are well managed. And this is how all economies could develop in history. You have to be confident in people who are well managing their enterprise. Public authorities do exactly the same. They lend money to people who are, who are badly managed. And the IMF is doing the same. IMF exists just because it gives resources to badly managed money. And it induces governments to do bad budget policies. So I think that we ought not to help to support Greek, the Greek policy, Greek governments. And uh, on the other side of the problem is that I don't understand why people quite often say there is a risk for the euro. There is no risk for the euro because uh, it just means that the Greek have to finance the financial sector with no consequence on the creation of euro. The problem, the working of the euro market depends on the monetary policy of the European Central Bank, and it is completely independent of the budget problem of the Greek government. To say that uh, here in this audience, uh, now, for too many people you're saying the biblical truth, but I have uh, some question about uh, the future. What do you think, um, when we should uh, expect a new wave of crisis, and um, uh, would, would be this crisis uh, so strong that people would think differently about the problems you are describing during your lecture? The management of bank, I, I anyhow have the feeling that there is a problem of education <clears throat> and that if, we, if there had been more managers in the banking sector we would have been educated with what is called the Austrian School of Economics theory of the cycle. Maybe some of them would have been how cautious. They would have learned it was impossible to go immediately with this process. But even bankers were not uh, well educated. 
So, I think with a very strong crisis, um, I fear that uh, people will not change their mind and happily. I say it is quite true that public opinion is supporting uh, the economic policies which are decided right now, but I don't see any reason uh, for public opinion to change, even worse, maybe, even worse, because um, uh, crisis, uh, the crisis gives an opportunity uh, for governments to expand their activity, to expand their powers, and to, uh, let, and to educate people in the bad way. Uh, because whenever a politician uh, is saying something, uh, it is um, spread all over the opinion by media. If I or you or you are saying something different, we have not the same possibility to spread new ideas. And so there is an asymmetry in the education of public opinion, and there is a fantastic opportunity for politicians to appear to and to explain what is wrong, but to explain what they want public opinion to believe. And at the limit, one could even believe that uh, the, the, some politicians are creating crisis in order to have the possibility to be in the first rank and to be under the cameras of the TV and so on. So I'm certainly more pessimistic than you are. First one might seem a bit rhetoric. Uh, well, you were saying that the, the measures which governments have taken are not particularly productive or they might be even wrong. On the other hand, we, we have seen that the liberal markets have brought us to that situation. So if you could just uh, briefly say, uh, is there any way out from this vicious circle? And the second question is more kind of concrete one. Uh, there have been recently there have been some uh, some researchers saying that there is a real threat of Chinese bubble, Chinese economy. So could you comment on that? Thank yeah. you. The first topic, I'm not certain I can give a recipe. I'm sorry for that, but uh, I don't really know how to to go out of this vicious circle. It is really a vicious circle. There are several vicious circles because, uh, for instance, I I mentioned that there was a. A tendency to increase the size of banks uh, because uh, uh, banks, big banks uh, are too big to fail, as it is said. And the, the larger the banks, the more uh, likely it is that we have the, uh, similar events in the future. So I, I really have no, no good idea in order to, to try to, to, to break this vicious circle. Now about the Chinese problem. Um, there are several aspects to that. And quite uh, often it is said that uh, there is a disequilibrium system because um, there is a very important trade surplus of China and very important trade deficit of the US uh, and that it cannot last for, for long. And politicians quite often uh, try to uh, push Chinese authorities to modify internal policies in order to, um, for people to, to consume more and to export less. But as I said, um, in a country like China, there is a high rate of savings because uh, people have to care about themselves. There is no pension uh, system, uh, uh, not real health insurance and so on. They have to save for education of children and so on. And it is quite characteristic that in China, we have a rate of savings more than 40% of GNP, which is really fantastic. Um, and this is the reason why we have such a high rate of growth in China. So in the US, we have a low rate of savings in China, but we have opportunities for investment. In China, we have a high rate of savings, high opportunities, but they are not unlimited anyhow. So it is quite normal that part of savings from China go to the US, and it means that Chinese people are buying American assets, and as a counterpart, they are selling commodities. 
So they have a trade uh, uh, surplus, and the U.S. have a trade deficit. But people are accustomed to the idea that a trade deficit means disequilibrium. And so they say we have to, we have to, to, uh, to, uh, to solve the, this disequilibrium. And uh, uh, for instance, we have to uh, reevaluate the Chinese money in order to diminish uh, this process of uh, trade surplus and trade deficit. I don't know to which extent it is completely equilibrium, but I think that uh, uh, mainly it is equilibrium and there is no real necessity uh, to reevaluate the Chinese money, ex 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 except that it is also true that monetary authorities in China are accumulating uh, reserves in dollars, maybe too many reserves, but one may say that it is one form uh, under which there is accumulation of capital in China and for instance in the future they may be able to finance retirement schemes or I don't know what by spending uh, these reserves and uh, there is no real necessity to to diminish them, and uh, in fact, I would even say that uh, the U.S. benefit from that because uh, you can produce money at zero cost, and as a co counterpart, you receive real commodities. So it is splendid for the U.S., and they would they ought not to complain about that. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's desirable, uh, but uh, as I said. And happily, it is considered that the trade deficit is a bad, is a bad thing. Now, there is another aspect of the problem, and uh, you mentioned that, which is that there may be a bubble in China. And I think it is true. It is true because right now, there is a very expansionary monetary policy in China, and uh, uh, there is a very high rate of increase in the price of assets, in housing, and so on. And we may have something similar to what we had in the U.S. with the rise in as asset prices and in, the, in housing and so on. And so there is a risk of, the, of a financial bubble. Um, the consequences will not be the same as the one of the U.S. bubble because uh, there is no real globalization of China's assets. Uh, the world is not... Uh, holding a lot of Chinese assets, it may be more purely Chinese problem than a world problem compared to what happened with the financial crisis. But I agree on that. There is a risk of a of a bubble in China. Yeah. Well, well uh, you mentioned that the, one of the worst effects of expansionary policy was uh, the distortion of production structure. Uh, and does the crisis itself has the opposite effect and uh, if there is any evidence of that? And also if there is any evidence that after crisis happened, uh, happened the uh, saving rates changed in some countries or so, something like that. Um, the, the crisis <coughs> is uh, the, the time in which um, the contradiction in the structure of production do appear, and that's the reason why we just have to let the crisis develop itself. It would have been better not to have this change in the structure of production, but the crisis in some sense has a positive aspect, which is to eliminate the distortions and to make um, uh, an adjustment. Um, now, it doesn't mean that there is an increase in savings. Uh, we have a long-run problem of savings. And during, before the crisis, we had the impression, we had the feeling that there was a high amount of savings. And the crisis makes clear that we have a lower amount of savings. But by itself, 
the crisis is not creating real savings, voluntary savings. And to have this, we ought to have a change in economic policies. And for instance, we would have to have tax cuts, uh, less regulations, uh, uh, we would have to have a development of uh, capitalization for pensions instead of pay as you go system. Uh, quite often people don't know that, but in the US, uh, the system is mainly a system of pay as you go pension uh, funds. So uh, by itself, the crisis doesn't solve this problem. And there would be a need for uh, uh, something in this direction, which is, by the way, just the contrary of what is done, because uh, there would be the need for a very um, deep, rapid tax cut. And because there is more spending, uh, there is a temptation to increase taxes. Maybe not right now, but in order to reimburse the, the debt. So that's uh, the problem. And that's also one of the vicious circle we, we see. The answer, uh, the bad answer are uh, uh, putting us farther and farther from what we would have, we would like to have. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mr. Selin. Uh, you mentioned earlier that this crisis uh, we are going through is actually a part of a recurring cycle, a uh, vicious circle. And I know that you cannot see, me, uh, see the future, but I'd still ask you to. And could you give an, uh, at least an approximate prognosis about if the right measures are taken, how much would it take the world to come out of its crisis and how much, uh, and how much of uh, stable time the world would have if uh, we actually come out of it? Uh, I really, I have to be honest and to say um, I, I cannot forecast that. Just because we don't know to which extent uh, the productive system in the world has been uh, disturbed by the bad uh, monetary policy. We know it has, and there are some cases which are very, very obvious, for instance, in, in housing, uh, car production, and so on. But we also know that all sectors are interdependent. They are selling commodities, one to the other, and so on. And so wh why did we have not only a financial crisis, but also an economic crisis? Just because uh, there was this strong structure of production I described, but also because th th there were distortions which were not well known uh, in other sectors uh, which were selling or purchasing from the uh, sectors I have mentioned. And for instance, um, let us take the, the, the case of uh, uh, car production. Uh, there was an impulse given to car production because many people buy cars by uh, uh, using credit. And as credit was not costly, people uh, make the, made the decision of buying cars. Now it's more difficult to have credits. So there was a crisis in this sector. And for instance, uh, some uh, countries in uh, Central Europe, like the Czech Republic, Hungary, and so on, suffered from that. Uh, the, the crisis uh, spread all over the world through two canals. One is a financial one, because many banks uh, outside the US uh, had assets uh, from the US with a subprime and so on. So uh, they had too many risks and they failed. And the second reason is the one I just mentioned. There, was a, 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 there were distortion in the structure of production and it spread all over the world, um, not only in the most capitalist sectors, but only, but also most capitalistic sectors, but also, also in other sectors. But I do not know to which extent uh, there were distortion. So I cannot know to which extent uh, uh, there will be uh, a, a good adjustment in this sector. Moreover, whenever the states are spending, 
and I just mentioned that the, the, the answer which is given is public spending. We don't really know to which sectors in particular this additional demand by the state is going. And they are creating, in some sense, new distortions because the demand by the public sector is not the same as the demand by the private sectors. And if we can expect, uh, which may be optimistic, but if we can expect that uh, little by little these very huge public deficits will diminish, it means that little by little the structure of production determined by this change in public deficits will go back to normality, but we don't know exactly uh, at which pace and uh, how it has been distorted and so on. So just because it is not a global problem, but a problem of structure, I cannot really uh, answer to your question. I would be, I would be like, I would like to, to be able to say, oh, I have the answer, I know everything, and so on. But uh, when you understand the working of economic system, I think we, we have to be modest. We, we know some very general principles. Uh, we know that uh, whenever you, uh, for instance, you adopt such or such policy, the consequence may be broadly speaking, that or that, but we don't know exactly to which extent, to some, to which degree, and so on. And similarly, we don't know exactly uh, how long it will be to, uh, to cure the problems, and especially because, as I said, we are once more launching uh, expansionary monetary policy. We are wasting resources with huge be deficit, so my guess would be that we may enter in a period of uh, slow rate of growth, of more or less stagnation. Uh, I think it is most likely uh, future, uh, but there is always the possibility of a miracle with a complete change of policies all over the world. I don't believe in it too much anyhow. So I think it is more likely than we have this uh, low rate of activity, maybe high rate of unemployment and uh, uh, some stagnation in some countries. Thank you, Professor. Once again, I would like to express my gratitude Thank by you. the name of our university for your so interesting and distinguished lecture. Thank, Thank you very much.